Please give us your name, position, and then your comments. Uh, good afternoon, um, Chairman and members. Thank you for having me. I'm Lisa Piercy. I'm the Commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Health. To my right is Grant Mullins, who's my Chief General Counsel. To my left is Patrick Powell, who's my lead liaison, most of you know. Uh, thank you for having me here today. I've got um, several slides, and I know you've got time constraints, as do I, and so we'll get right to it. Um, I first wanted to give you just a little bit of an overview of where we are uh, with COVID. Thankfully, it's not in the news every day, uh, so I wanted to give you a little bit of an update. Uh, we've had some very, very dramatic declines. I have a visual representation of that in just a moment. And we're also um, dealing with a changing vaccine landscape. You will recall just short, uh, six short months ago, um, it was like gold. And people were literally, sometimes even physically fighting over it. Uh, they were driving long distances. Um, it was very in demand. Uh, that has come almost to a screeching halt. Although, interestingly, we have had some pickup in the last couple of weeks in our vaccination rates. So what we have done to change the landscape is we have tailored it uh, from the very large groups and are funneling it more narrowly now to very small groups going on site, uh, still making it available in the traditional ways, uh, but trying to meet people where they are. You uh, have also heard that uh, recently the vaccines were approved, or the Pfizer product uh, in, in particular, was approved down to age 12. Um, anytime there's a change in any kind of vaccine, we message to our providers as well as individuals. Uh, and then now that uh, kids have been approved or adolescents have been approved, all of the appropriate agencies, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, do uh, recommend that. So something that this has brought up during this conversation is uh, an EUA. And uh, I will admit, if you're anything like me, you'd probably never heard of an EUA before this. Um, vaccines are not the only thing that have had an EUA during this process. You will remember remdesivir, which is the uh, antiviral treatment, saved hundreds if not thousands of lives here just in this state. Same thing with monoclonal antibody, and I know there are members in this room that have benefited from monoclonal antibody uh, under an EUA. Vaccines are no different. So basically what an EUA is, is you get all of your studies done, but they compress the regulatory approval process. Doesn't mean any of the step, steps were skipped, uh, but it was accelerated. And as part of an EUA, they also apply for a full, it's called a BLA, um, and that process can take up to a year. Obviously, we didn't have a year to spare uh, in the last several months, and so uh, the BLA is uh, pending approval for the, uh, for the Pfizer product as well as the others as well. Um, like I said, that typically takes about a year. Uh, FDA has committed to trying to get that done in the next few months. Uh, we expect full approval probably later this summer. So I know some questions were raised about the mature minor doctrine, and uh, that's why I brought my counsel today in case you have legal questions. Uh, but this does stem from case law that dates back to 1987, uh, maybe with a few exceptions before any of us were in our current roles. Um, the memo that was sent out by our vaccine program director was uh, in response to a lot of questions that we had gotten from providers. Now, let me give you a distinction of who the audience was and who it was not. So the audience of that were enrolled vaccine providers, not all, not all physicians, not all doctor's offices, uh, and nobody outside of, of vaccine providers. So um, schools, civic organizations did not get this letter, just our um, enrolled providers. That's pretty common what we do. We uh, communicate with our enrolled providers anytime there's a significant change. We had gotten several questions and, you know, like with most things, when you get a handful of questions uh, from a group, there's probably more out there with the same questions, so answering that. Uh, I've already mentioned what an EUA is and, and how Pfizer uh, has been approved down to age 12 through the EUA process. And then we've talked about enrolled providers. So what this doctrine does is it is an allowance. It's not a requirement. It's an allowance for providers who in their discretion with adolescents age 14 and up, if in their discretion they feel comfortable giving this service uh, without a parent there or without parental consent, they have the ability to do that. They are not required to do so. And uh, I think you're well aware I'm a pediatrician, and so this was something that I dealt with in practice a lot, particularly with older adolescents. 
Most pediatricians, a lot of pediatricians, particularly uh, in my neck of the woods in West Tennessee, do not do this. They, even though they can, uh, they insist on having parental consent there. Um, so there are a lot more services other than vaccines that this applies to, STDs, family planning, uh, substance abuse treatment. Uh, but something that's very different and uh, grateful for Representative Sapicki and his um, uh, request to communicate with LEAs about how this is different in schools. This does not apply in schools because there is a different statute that covers medical treatment in schools. It requires written parental consent for any medical treatment of any age child in a school setting. That is up to and including over-the-counter medications uh, such as aspirin or Tylenol. So uh, I wanted to clarify that for you. And then an another question that had been raised is, well, just how often does this happen? And you know, when you look in the, um, uh, the, the data that has to be entered into the medical record when, uh, and let me caveat this by saying, I can only speak for health department sites. I cannot speak for what happens at the Walmart pharmacy or the you know, CVS pharmacy or, or anywhere else. But uh, in our health department sites, there is no specific checkbox that says unaccompanied or whatever. Um, and so there's really not a good way to query the medical record on how many come in. So we did it the good old fashioned way and surveyed our folks. And out of all of the sites, all 89 uh, rural health departments, um, they came up with less than 10 kids that had presented unaccompanied. And those kids fell into two categories, five of them were there for services, some other kind of service. They were there unaccompanied, mostly family planning, but could be STD treatment. Uh, and they were offered the vaccine while they were there and they wanted to do that. The other three were my own children, who I sent unaccompanied to get their second dose because they're 16 and their mom works. And so they uh, got the other three. So we can come up with eight kids statewide uh, that have presented at health departments unaccompanied. Chairman, you also asked us to review um, some of different trends the, uh, in your questions that you sent to me and uh, this committee on Saturday. This is a graph of, this is what we call our epi curve, and uh, you can see that our seven-day new case average is 289. I think that'll be even lower next week. Yesterday, we had 129 cases statewide. It is almost non-existent in Tennessee right now. I don't want to say that this is over or this is done, uh, but we have had tremendous success uh, battling this here in Tennessee. And that's for a couple of reasons. So you might, it would be natural for you to think, um, okay, why do I see all of these headlines that Tennessee is behind the nation in vaccination efforts, but yet you're telling me the rates are as low as they were in March of last year. I want to remind you, and, and this group knows, but just as a refresher, immunity comes from two different sources, natural immunity and acquired immunity. Natural immunity is what you have after you get infected, and we have continuing and ongoing evidence uh, of the duration of that. Uh, and then acquired immunity is through vaccine. So it, it's a little irritating to me when I see these um, news reports and they have this timeline to herd immunity at 70%. That's not 70% vaccination, that's 70% immune. Now, let me tell you, while natural immunity is good, it does not appear to be as consistent or as durable as acquired immunity through a vaccine. But because we did have a very high infection rate here in Tennessee in November and December and January, we have a lot of people who are naturally immune. So when you combine that and the people who have acquired immunity through vaccination, uh, you can see our rates are exceedingly low right now. Uh, this is broken down by metro region, um, so you can see all of the different curves are approximating themselves now uh, in all of the metro areas, and then you see a similar curve for the rural areas. Um, this, this chart is one that I think uh, is really, really remarkable. You'll remember hearing about positivity rates, some people called that attack rates, and back in December and January, we got up into the low to mid 20s. That means one out of every five tests that were done were positive. Right now, the rate is 2.6%. That's what it was at the very beginning. And the reason that that is remarkable is because that's 2.6% of all tests that are done are positive. Now, 
the denominator is a lot smaller because people aren't getting tested because they're worried or because they're going to travel or whatever, just because they're curious. We call those the worried well. It's really only people who have symptoms now. So only 2.6% of people who have symptoms uh, are testing positive, which is a very, very good indicator of our uh, epi curve. Chairman, you ask us about uh, median age. Uh, the median age of cases has fallen uh, since the peak in December, which was 41. It's now at 35. Similarly, the median age of hospitalization has gone from 71 down to 61. And then the age of fatal cases uh, has also come down. It's hovering uh, around 70, uh, and that's down almost 10 years as well from its peak. Now, I think this is an interesting chart, and I want you to sort of um, let the shape of this curve sort of burn in your head because I want you to compare it to the next slide. So this is the shape of, a cur of the curve of um, case numbers by age bracket. So if you can't see it down there at the bottom, uh, 0 to 10, uh, 11 to 20, and on down. You will see, just as I showed you um, a minute ago, the, the median age is uh, in the 30s, and, and you can see the highest number um, in 21 to 30, but then the median of all ages is 35. So if you kind of can remember the distribution of this curve and then compare it to the next slide, which is the distribution of vaccination. And so in Tennessee, older people have availed themselves of the vaccine a lot more than younger people. There are a lot of reasons for that. Um, some of them are very understandable. Um, but what you do see is when you go back, the same people who haven't been vaccinated are more likely to have cases. That does not necessarily mean they're more likely to be hospitalized or to have serious outcomes. Um, but you can see a very clear distinction there where um, those who are older and have higher vaccination rates in the older age ranges uh, obviously have less cases. Chairman, you also ask us about cases amongst children. Um, you may not have uh, seen these data sets that I'm about to present. They are on our website. Um, so if you're ever interested in uh, pediatric cases, uh, this dashboard is there. This is pulled from that information. Uh, this is the, the blue bars at the top are the epi curve for children. And then um, the orange line is the percent of the total. You can see that pretty much all along, uh, we've hovered around plus or minus 20% of the cases being in children. And then when you break that down uh, by age, you can see that about half of our childhood cases are in adolescents. That makes a lot of sense. They're the ones going out and about, participating in extracurricular sports, uh, et cetera. We were also asked about the age of hospitalization. We have fortunately only had 370 children hospitalized in the state uh, because of COVID. Uh, that is 0.3% of the total hospitalization. So it is, it's a pretty unusual occurrence. But then when you break it down by age group, this is the second, um, second set of data there, it is uh, primarily in or, or in a large portion in infants and in teenagers. So um, uh, when we talk about children with hospitalization, uh, we talk about those on either end of the pediatric age spectrum. One of the questions that we commonly get is um, about comorbidities. So basically, what are the underlying conditions that these kids, that may have made these kids more likely to be hospitalized? Um, and in a lot of instances, particularly in the infants, these are infants with congenital birth defects, congenital heart defects. Uh, in adolescents, it's oftentimes kids with asthma uh, and kids with other respiratory conditions that make them more susceptible to these respiratory type illnesses. Similarly, amongst deaths, uh, eight is too many, but we have only had eight uh, pediatric deaths. Uh, you can see that they're pretty evenly spread out by age bracket there at the bottom. Um, but when you compare that uh, across the age spectrum, obviously children account for a very minuscule portion, uh, fortunately, of deaths. So we were asked to convert this to rates, um, and our cumulative hospitalization rate is about 28 per 100,000 for kids less than age 20. Uh, and similarly, mortality rate is about a half, uh, 0 0.5 deaths per 100,000. I'll compare that to some other rates in just a moment. Um, but what is difficult to do 
uh, is to, in, in response to your questions, Chairman, uh, is to compare that to what it would be for kids with and without comorbidities. Uh, because children, unlike adults, generally we don't have a good denominator of what kids have what conditions uh, like we do with adults as much. Um, so it's hard to um, do some of the population calculations that were requested, but, but th these are the numbers that we could calculate. Some of the other questions that we were asked, it's just too soon to tell. The uh, approval only came about a month ago on May 10th, and so uh, with a three-week dose but, or three-week interval between doses and then another 14 days after the second dose to be considered fully immune, uh, we are still way too early to, to tell a lot of the um, outcomes that, that were requested. Here's an interesting slide. It's off the CDC uh, website, and it compares relative mortality. So what I told you a minute ago was that the mortality rate of children in Tennessee from COVID is 0 0.56 per 100,000. Uh, and in case you can't see the um, labels to these, that top line, it's blue, it's uh, around 30 per 100,000 is natural causes. These are generally children with medical conditions, uh, childhood cancers, uh, congenital birth defects. The next line down, which is pretty far down, is the red line, which is an accident line. So that's a, around 10 per 100,000. And then the bottom two are suicide and homicide uh, in the two to three range per 100,000. Uh, so uh, it is very easy to see that the mortality rate from COVID in children is much lower than it is from these other causes, uh, but we were asked to show that comparison. We're also asked about MSIC, which is multi-system inflammatory condition in children. And uh, these are pretty serious cases. And you can see we've had plus or minus 170 of these. About half of them have had to be in the ICU. And the ones who are in the ICU are there for, uh, on average, about four days. One child stayed 31 days in the ICU. Some of these children had underlying conditions. A lot of them did not. Uh, and fortunately, we have only had uh, two deaths through MISC, uh, but it has affected children uh, across the state, uh, particularly in our urban areas. We were asked uh, for some data from the VAERS system. Uh, VAERS is uh, sort of the uh, adverse event system that uh, is housed at CDC. But I think there may be a little confusion of what is and what is not in VAERS. So VAERS is an early warning indicator. And you can put anything in VAERS from my arm was sore to I you know, had a headache or I didn't feel well to things that are much more serious. What it doesn't have is uh, mortality data or hospitaliza hospitalization data. This is an early warning trigger to say, okay, we see X number of people have entered this unusual symptom uh, in this time frame, and so it triggers further investigation. It is just one of those systems. One of the things that we were asked about that has recently popped up in VAERS uh, is myocarditis or pericarditis, which is an inflammation of the heart muscle or the sac around the heart, respectively. And what we've seen is that this is primarily in younger people under age 30, a little bit more propensity for males versus females, sort of your older uh, male teenager, young adult uh, is, is the one that will get it most commonly, uh, but it is still extraordinarily rare. It, it, using round numbers, there's been about 400 cases out of 18 million doses. So pretty unusual, but you may be thinking, well, wait, the J&J &J was a lot less than that and they paused it. So why aren't they pausing this? A couple of reasons. One, in the J&J &J pause, that was a very serious and oftentimes life-threatening condition. Very different than this myocarditis. Most of these are well, uh, have mild symptoms, and do not even require hospitalization. The other very key difference between this and the J&J &J pause uh, a couple of months ago is that the Johnson & Johnson, uh, the condition spurred by the Johnson & Johnson vaccine did not respond to traditional treatment. In fact, remember it was blood clots, right? Blood clots in the brain generally. Uh, and if you use traditional treatment, patients actually got worse and could die because of the treatment that, because it, it needed a different treatment. So the pause was given to educate providers on, hey, don't treat it this way, be on the lookout and don't treat it in the traditional way, treat it in this other way. 
um, and then it was resumed. This, because it uh, does respond to traditional therapy, uh, they, um, uh, the CDC has decided to keep going forward uh, and educate providers uh, with no change in vaccine recommendation. And I want to conclude uh, with uh, what, what I've been doing lately. I've just come in this morning from Sevier County. I'm making my way to a lot of different uh, county health departments this month just to say thank you and to recognize the staff. Um, and I would implore you to do the same if you ever have the opportunity. Uh, these guys have worked in the heat and the cold and the snow, and they've gotten spit on and cussed at and swung at uh, and insulted unnecessarily uh, because of the work uh, that they're doing in public service. Uh, so if you see members of health departments, if you see members of the National Guard, uh, give them an extra pat on the back and a big thank you uh, because they are the true heroes in all of this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, you've heard the presentation. Uh, do we have questions of the committee? Senator Bowling, you're on my list first, then Senator Bell, then Senator Pody. Uh, I'll get to you. <laughs> thank you very much, Commissioner Piercy, for coming and speaking with us, and thank you for the work y'all have done during this last year. Um, all of us are glad this last year's over. <laughs> so, um, and I'm sure you are more than any. But our concern here today is the, mature minor, the misapplication in our estimation of the mature minor, um, which is a judicial doctrine, not Tennessee code, not law, not empowering, not enabling. And um, when you look at the original rule of seven that was corollary to the doctrine, uh, at that time the age of majority was 21. And uh, now the age of majority has been moved down to 18. But in any of these instances where we see things that have gone out from the Department of Health encouraging 12-year-olds uh, to come get a shot, in Tennessee, we are a common law state, and 12-year-olds are under the responsibility and authority of their parents, and it's very disconcerting to see the letter or memo from uh, Dr. F F Fiscus, Fiscus um, stating that Tennessee law allows the Department of Health to give vaccinations to children 14 years of age. Um, the Tennessee law does not allow that. The, the doctrine, the judicial doctrine, is the protocol that will be used in cases when people are being brought before a judge and jury because they have violated parental rights. I just want to express that we would appreciate that, um, as you stated earlier, the, the landscape has changed. Initially, everybody really wanted a shot, mm -hmm. and now you're having to kind of get out and push it. Um, we are almost, it seems, have reached herd immunity, vaccination immunity, whatever. The people have not taken the shot are because people have made their personal medical decision not to take the shot. And to then go in and start um, getting children to come in that you have no authority to give them an emergency use authorized medicine, medical intervention, um, we, it, it was shocking. And so we appreciate you being here today. And I know many people here have received many calls from across the state. Parents are rightly concerned, angry, uh, disappointed, shocked, all the different words you could use. I, as, as Deputy Speaker, am encouraging the Department of Health to back off the misapplication and misunderstanding of a judicial doctrine and to go back to what the law is. And in one of the um, pieces of paper, I think you said that, that um, you know, we have the right to give the children the shot and that there are expressly some um, things in Tennessee code also, let's see, certain statutes also explicitly permit the treatment of minors for specific conditions. I would submit to you that these statutes are the only things that allow you to permit have treatments to minors. And they are very limited because the other things are not part of what the state considers um, available to any medical care provider. And typically in the rule of seven and the, uh, the doctrine, the judicial doctrine, they were, as I said, 
saying what would be considered in a court of law if someone violates a parental's authority. And so I, I think we need to get that righted and have some assurance from the Department of Health that you all will not provide an emergency use authorized prophylactic, and there are other prophylactics available. And so some of the rules with regarding the mandating any of that is if there's no other prophylactic available. But D3, zinc, you know, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, mm -hmm. there are other things available that people are choosing to use other than the shot. So um, that, that's my spiel. I appreciate your listening, and I appreciate uh, hearing back from you with some action the Department of Health will take uh, to remove the fear, the concerns, and the, the anger that has gone across the state as a result of the letter. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective, uh, ma'am. We at the department strongly believe that vaccine is a personal choice, uh, and we view our role as making it available for those who want it. Senator Bell, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a couple questions. When you were talking about the state of Tennessee uh, right now having a very low positivity rate, the, the virus, we're averaging 200 and something cases a day now and how it's virtually almost gone. We hope it, we hope it is. And, but yet we have a very low vaccination rate as well. How, do, how does our positivity rate with tests and our, I guess, incident rate compare to states with high vaccination rate? Is there much difference? Sure, that's a great question, and actually it reminds me of a, of a data point that I meant to uh, remind you of earlier. So to answer your question, it looks very similar to everywhere else. In fact, it looks better than some states, quite frankly. Um, I want to level set on where our vaccination rate is and is not, because you get the, the headlines of you know, worst in the nation. Yeah. Fortunately, we're not worst anymore, but we're still in the bottom five or six, depending on which graph you look at. But if you look at, and I'm, again, going to use round numbers here, Tennesseans, about 40% have had at least one dose. The national average is 51.2. So it's not, it's, there's not this huge delta. There is a gap, and, and the gap is widening, although, like I mentioned, uh, a couple, uh, the last couple of weeks, we've had a little bit of a surge in first doses. So it seems like there are some people who, and we saw this in our market research, weren't a no, they were just a not right now. And so a lot of those people are coming back around. Uh, but we are seeing very low rates here, uh, very, very low hospitalizations. Uh, I believe this morning's numbers, we were in around 300 hospitalizations statewide. Compare that to the thousands we had in December. So I'm, I'm very encouraged. Right. Um, and it, of course, my, my point is it doesn't seem to make it, there's not a lot of difference though between our state and states with the high vaccination rate. Which is interesting, I not, think. Not right now. Not right now. Not right now. Okay, my second question, and I know you mentioned this in my conversations with Patrick before. We, we've talked about this as well. You referenced a case law. Can you be specific? Tell me what that case was. That's why I brought my counsel. Okay. Tell me, if you, if you would, get, go into what the case law specifically, what it dealt with at that time. Uh, you know, was it, did it dealt with a medical procedure, vaccinations, an emergency? What, what did it deal with? And what other areas of... Tennessee uh, policy, I guess, uh, re reference back to that case law. Is there any other uh, um, uh, policy standard procedures that we have in the health department or any other department that reference back to this case? Certainly, Chairman. Um, so the specific facts of that case in 1987, and I'm talking about Cardwell v. Bechtel from 1987, Tennessee Supreme Court case that adopted the, the doctrine. Um, in that instance, it was a, 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 I think, either a 16 or 17-year-old female who was presenting to her uh, osteopath for some type of, it was not a surgery, but it was some type of adjustment, physical uh, adjustment, um, disc kind of thing. Um, that, she had the treatment, it was outpatient, she left, it was, she came of her own volition, she left of her own volition, I believe she drove herself there. Um, what the court looked at in that, in, well, and let me back up, prior to the adoption of the DAT doctrine by the Tennessee Supreme Court, the legislature had enacted some carve-outs specifically for minors to receive treatment. And so that involves contraception, treatment of uh, minor drug abusers, of course, emergency treatment, prenatal, um, pre, uh, peripartum. Um, and so 
those were all preexistent prior to the adoption of the doctrine. And I've got those citations if you would like them. But what the court did was say, um, we are kind of adopting this tiered system, the rule of sevens, and it talked about consent. And I've specifically it said, quote, if the person consenting is a child, consent may still be effective if he is capable of appreciating the nature, extent, and probable consequences of the conduct consented to. And, quote, when, minor, when the minor has ability of the average person to understand and weigh the risks and benefit of the provision involved. Uh, so that's the specific thing that that court case was adopting. Now, that court case has been cited um, over 500 times, still good law in Tennessee. Um, but that is the seminal case that was the adoption of the doctrine. Okay. Right. Thank you. Senator Pote, you recognized? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, thank you for being here. Can you tell me what is our current supply of vaccinations? Do we, uh, do we have enough? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, yes, in fact, we have more than what we need. Uh, probably three weeks ago, we stopped ordering the maximum allocation. Uh, you, rem you remember early on, we were trying to get every single dose, but about three weeks ago, uh, we started leaving some on the table because we didn't want them to expire on our shelves here. Uh, I know that we gave 94,000 last week. And so that's still, it, you get the sense that this is ground to a halt and it's not. I mean, we still gave 94,000 vaccines last week, uh, but we are only ordering what we need to backfill the openings. All right, and our distribution system, is it adequate? Yes, sir. All right, so anybody that wants the vaccine can get the vaccine. What is the rate of fully vaccinated people that we have in Tennessee, not first shot, fully vaccinated people. Fully vaccinated people this morning, I think was in the upper 30s, 37 or 39. Uh, it's right around, it's just shy of 40%. Okay, so almost 60% of the people have chosen not to get the vaccine. Can you tell me why that would be? Sure, um, so some of those under age 12 are not eligible to do so. Uh, some have medical conditions, although that's pretty rare that they wouldn't get it. Uh, the vast majority who are not vaccinated is because they've made that personal choice. And as I mentioned to uh, Chairman Bowling, I uh, am support. We are supportive of that at the department, and uh, know that it's a personal choice and respect that. So, if the vast majority or the majority of Tennesseans have made that personal choice as adults, this um, idea of a minor mature doctrine. We're thinking that a 14-year-old that wouldn't even know how to research the benefits and the risks of a possible vaccination that's underneath only emergency authorization, they can make a decision whether it's right for them for their entire life. Is that what I'm understanding? Uh, the way I understand it is that provision has been in place since 1987. So, um... uh, excuse me, Commissioner, I'm asking this vaccination, this one, that hasn't even been fully examined, that we don't even know what the long-term effects are, that the majority of Tennesseans have said no to. But the Health Department of Tennessee says we should let 14-year-olds, if they choose, have this vaccination. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, yes, sir. Okay. I don't know how the terms that I could use to express my extreme disappointment in the state of Tennessee where the majority of the adults said no, to think that a 14-year-old child could say yes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Representative Stewart, you're recognized. I'm sorry, so, Commissioner, did you have a response? No, sir. Representative Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you've mentioned this, the, the low vaccination rates in Tennessee. Um, is there anything you can be doing to get us out of the bottom 10 of states in terms of number of vaccinated people? If so, what are they? What are the steps? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and part of the response goes back to what we as a state see our role in vaccination, uh, which is to make it readily available and widely distributed, which uh, has already been uh, on the record. The other thing is that we see our role is as educators. And you have seen uh, PSA starting to roll out. There's a six month campaign called Give It a Shot, uh, and it talks about here are some of the common misconceptions and, and here are what the facts are. Uh, so there's an educational campaign. Uh, but we know that people 
are most persuaded by those that they know and trust, not a government official standing up there saying one thing or another. And so we are helping to support faith-based organizations, community organizations, employers, uh, all of those who want to offer that, uh, we're supporting it. So uh, it's a multifactorial approach, uh, trying to do everything we can. It hurts my feelings just as much as it does yours to be uh, in the lower 40s. Do, do you think that, uh, you know, there was testimony about the availability of vaccines. Um, obviously, there's some parts of the state like Nashville where we know people are close to uh, vaccination opportunities. What about rural Tennessee? You know, what about 50 miles off the interstate? Obviously, technically, people can get vaccines, but how is our availability in those areas? That's a great question because we um, have a very strong focus on rural access within the Department of Health. And we ha now have over 900 providers statewide. The health departments are only about 10% of those. We have about 90, well, we have 95 health departments across the state. Uh, and so, but over 900 providers, all of the Walmarts, all of the Walgreens, almost all of your chain pharmacies have those now. Many doctor's offices and local pharmacies have them as well. Uh, so it's the, it's, Having it accessible and readily available for people where they are uh, and the convenience factor will um, uh, ostensibly drive participation. Is it, is it, can we assume that in every county of the state there's a place where somebody can get a free vaccine every single day, yes, every sir. weekday? Excuse me, yes, sir. So if I'm in any county in the state, I'm just saying this because people may be watching, if I'm in any county in the state in Tennessee, there is a place where somebody can go on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and get a free vaccine somewhere. That That's right? correct. And in most cases, just walk up even without an appointment. Where would you recommend people go to figure that out? If I'm up in Morgan County or Scott County, where do I go if I'm just a citizen, decided this morning to go get a vaccine? Where do I go to figure that out? What would you recommend? The best place to start is vaccinefinder.org. You can put in your zip code or your address and it will show you how far away all the vaccine sites are. The benefit of that site is it will show you what product is available or products. And so if you have a particular product preference, uh, you can see which products they have as well. Uh, pardon me, Representative Stewart. I, I hate to do this because I wanna give everybody a chance, but we still have people on our list and we want some public members. So make this your last question, please. Uh, we might argue about that on a different day, Chairman, but that was my last question, oh, so thank we're you. good. <laughs> Representative Lafferty, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just curious, you mentioned earlier, early in your comments, uh, that the immunity provided by the shot was perhaps better than the natural immunity. Given the short time frame, uh, you've got numbers, I guess, to back that up or some... Could you elaborate a little bit, I guess? Sure. To clarify, I said it's more consistent and durable, not necessarily better. It's not stronger, but it may be longer. So uh, we do know that people who have had infection and have natural immunity, they can be fully protected for, well, we know at least eight months because that's it's, uh, eight months to a year is how long people have been infected and they're still showing immunity. Maybe much longer than that, time will tell. Related to um, uh, those who have had the uh, immunis or have had the disease, but then have gotten sick again, we know that depending on your immune system, whether you're elderly, whether you're on immunocompromising drugs, you may have spottier immunity. So it might not be as consistent and it might not be as long. The duration is yet to be determined because as you mentioned, it's only been a few months. Uh, but the consistency, we do know that some people seem to have waning antibodies uh, and therefore we know that the vaccine provides a little more consistency with that. Good, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Representative Cochran, did you wish to ask a question? Next on the list is Representative Dixie. Uh, thank you. Actually, uh, Representative Lafferty pretty much asked the question that I wanted to, and I was going to ask about the natural, um, natural immunity. And so basically natural immunity is basically if you've had it and then you're saying that you're immune to it. And, yes, and you alluded to my, my question that I was going to have, that, that people who have natural immunity, they have contracted the disease after that. So, um, and we don't know the actual amount of time that the um, natural immunity lasts right. um, because he definitely, it may last for, there's no, there's been no study of how that lasts, right? That's right. Yeah, we have to wait until 
it runs out before we know. We know it's still good, but eight, nine, ten months out. Um, I'm hopeful that that will last for years. I'm not sure about that, right. though. So right, right now it's safe to say that um, we cannot rely on natural immunity as a long-term solution. It so. is not the most consistent or durable. Thank yes, you. sir. Chairman Sapicki, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for, first of all, I want to say thank you. Um, last month I brought up a concern with our LEAs, with our LEAs, um, and you and Commissioner Swin responded very quickly and put that fire out very quickly. I want to say, first of all, thank you for doing that. So you deserve kudos for that. Um, I'm one here who sits very skeptical of the Department of Health right now, very skeptical, and for that matter, leadership. Um, you know, we talk about um, uh, we're not targeting our youth for vaccinations right now. Let me tell you, we are. And the Department of Health is targeting our youth. Um, when you have uh, advertisements like this with a young girl with a patch on her arm all smiling, we know how impressionable um, our young people are and wanting to fit in in life. Um, for a department in this state of ours, to make it seem like to be included, to be able to be on the football team or be on a girls' soccer team or to participate in band, that you get this shot so you won't miss any of yours, that's peer pressure applied by the state of Tennessee, by your department. Personally, I think it's reprehensible that we would do that to our youth in Tennessee. And for that matter, when you start talking about people who have not gotten the shot and they get COVID, there are people that have received the shot and gotten COVID. And we even segue further than that, talking about this emergency use vaccine. I can pull up, and I'm not going to tell you which one it is, but I pulled up uh, just a normal diabetes medicine that's used right now. And there's a plethora of things that they disclose to the public that could be a side effect. We know that there's already across the world outbreaks of, of people who have gotten these, these vaccinations and have blood clots and, and, and health problems. But for some reason, there's no disclosure from the state of Tennessee about, hey, by the way, you could get this as a 14-year-old. You could go against your parents' wishes. You don't even know what you're putting in your body. And we don't even take the time to tell people the, the, the possible uh, outcomes of, of, of these vaccines. There was a concert the other day right down here in Nashville by Miss Cyrus about people who've gotten vaccines. Now, that concert, trust me, was not targeted for someone like me, okay? It was targeted for our youth. And I'll bet you they had places there that you could get your vaccine from vaccine providers. When the vaccine, when COVID first started, we were all sitting here back in March of 2020. And the numbers that we were hearing were frightening of what, what was going to happen. And when people started to come down with COVID, they started putting them on respirators. People started dying. I remember sitting up here and hearing that, you know, Mr. So-and-so back in the district con contracted COVID. He's in the ICU on a respirator. And I thought, oh, no. We found out it's not the right thing to do. And so we pivoted. We've never pivoted that there are other alternatives to the shot. It's you got to have the shot. And now it's to the point where we've got, um, we've got schools, colleges and universities here in Tennessee, public colleges and universities, saying you have to get the shot. Or you got to wear a mask. Or you may have to stay virtual. The CDC has just published... Uh, a list, unvaccinated and vaccinated people, and the do's and don'ts, where you can go, where you can't go wearing a mask. We have put ourselves so far into a shell as a society, and we've let the government, and I remember Ronald Reagan saying the most fearful words in the world are, I'm here from the government and I'm here to help. We have let that happen in Tennessee to us, and there is absolutely no reason that we should allow that to happen and allow 
our Department of Health to lead the charge with the mature minor doctrine. And, and I, I'm going to disagree with you. I read the letter from Dr. Fiscus. I don't think she's here right now. Boy, I wish she was, because she may have not have said, go ahead and vaccinate these kids, but boy, she sure gave the roadmap on how to do it and get around it with the law. Unbelievable that would happen in our great state of Tennessee. And we would sit here and allow that to happen. I saw the response that you gave to uh, Representative Smith, and I could go on. I think we have just, just touched the tip of the iceberg here with the Department of Health. We are, I'm one of 99 and 33 senators, and we represent 7.5 million people in the great state of Tennessee. And let me tell you, it is the great state of Tennessee because everybody in the world I'm a mortgage banker. Everybody in the world <laughs> is trying to get to Tennessee right now. Go look at home prices. Mm -hmm. So we must be doing it really well. And to target our children, our children, and to, su and to circumvent the authority of a parent. I haven't even got to the question of, let's say a child gets vaccinated. I want to first to know, is there a definition of how a doctor can cover themselves financially? and medically to allow a 14-year-old to say, yeah, go ahead and give me the shot? And then what happens if that child has an adverse reaction and winds up in the ICU unconscious on life support? Who's paying for that? And how do you know as a parent, your child comes home and gets sick two days later, how do you know what they did if they never tell you? I know the one thing I've been taught is if, if my child ever takes something that's poisonous, Make sure you go to the emergency room with what they took so they can figure out how to treat it. As a parent, if I don't know what they've, what they've taken or what they've done, how do I tell the medical professional how to treat them and save their lives? It is utterly ridiculous that we sit here. Chairman Sapicki, in the interest of time... I'll wrap you... this up right now, Mr. Chairman. I think we need to have more discussion on this next month. At this time, hopefully, Mr. Chairman, it's appropriate. I'm going to make this motion. I make a motion that we bring the doctor back here, the Commissioner of Health, next month to continue this discussion, not only on, on the VAERS not being on um, all our disclosures, about targeting our youth, about uh, pushing this vaccine to where the people of Tennessee have already said no, and then lastly, for consideration for the dissolving and reconstitution of the Department of Health in a motion, Mr. Chairman. Do we, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Members of the committee, is there any discussion on the motion? Chairman Roberts, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, I, I was probably not going to make any comments, and I, I did not know that, um, uh, that the representative was going to make the motion, but there was something that I wanted to say, and it's very relevant to the motion. I want all the members to understand the Department of Health is legislatively created. It is not constitutionally mandated. And um, so one of the things that, that, um, that I did want to point out later is that although we didn't have any specific action that we intended to take today, be aware of the fact that there's a full range of motions available to us. So related to this specific motion, uh, this department is constitutionally or is not constitutionally mandated. It's legislative creatively, legislatively created, thank you. And any federal dollars that flow to the Department of Health, uh, I believe, if I'm correct, can be assigned to F&A to be spent as the federal government would, would dictate. So I think it would be very unusual for a state not to have a Department of Health, but that is legislatively possible. It is not constitutionally mandated. So I, I insert that right now, and then I want to be recognized a little bit later on for some maybe some other comments, but since that's relative to the motion at hand, thank you. Any other comments on the motion? To, to re just a minute, uh, Representative Stewart, to recap the motion, it was to consider the dissolution and reconstitution at the next meeting. Representative Stewart, you recognize on the motion. Yes, I've probably uh, been as critical of the Department of Health as anybody in this room, but I don't think it's a good idea for this body to uh, demand reconstitution of uh, the governor's departments as a routine matter. I'll be opposed to the motion. I just don't think that's a good way to run our government. Doesn't need to have anything to do with this solution. 
Uh, Doug, you're recognized for comment, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, Doug Garrett with the Office of Legal Services. Uh, they would need, the Department of Health would need to officially act relative to its function, would need to reappear before um, the respective joint evaluation committee or the members of the committee as a whole to take official action. Um, that's not something that, that can be done, at least at this hearing initially. Thank you. Uh, Representative Sapicki, would you like to modify your mo motion on the basis of what has been said, just to recall them and then potentially uh, uh, do something else at the, at the recall? So my question, Mr. Chairman, is didn't I do that? That we would consider whether or not next month when they come back here uh, under a recall that we would, one of the things that we would consider is a... Um, okay. And, and uh, Mr. Garrett, is that correct on that? Okay. So the motion stands then. Senator Bell, on the motion, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is on a motion. And just so I understand it, so the motion is to call the department back in front of us next month and at that time at least have on the table a reconstitution of it. And, that, and my, my question is, we don't, while it could be part of the motion, it doesn't have to be part of the motion. I think Chairman Roberts said any possibility is open to us when we meet. Uh, so my question is to the maker, of the motion, why have that in there? Uh, either make a motion to reconstitute them right now or don't. Uh, but to make a motion, well, when we meet next week, we're going to consider it, or next month, we're going to consider it just, we can do that anyway, even, even if it's not part of the motion. Uh, I mean, that can be done at any time. Chairman uh, speaking. So, oh, so okay. I, I guess that, that's, that's my question. Chairman if, speaking. If, if, the, um, I'm sorry. Again, I, I, would, I, would, I would I would defer to the chairman, especially, especially both both chairmen. But uh, um, a motion just to have them come back in next month and continue this conversation is is what I think your goal is and what we need. And at that time, we can consider anything. Chairman Spicky, would you like to address that? Yeah, yes, I would. I, I I appreciate the senator's comments. I think one of the things that we have to realize is the seriousness of where we are right now in the state of Tennessee with the Department of Health targeting our youth right now. Targeting our youth. And, I, and I've never said that I want to dissolve and reconstitute the Department of Health. What I said is when we come back next month, I want that as, an op, as a consideration because there's been some things that senators and representatives have asked of the Department of Health and I think what's only fair is we give them the time for next month to come back and tell us what actions, what actions they have taken. And if they haven't taken the appropriate actions to get us where we feel that we have confidence in the department, then, then we, we take action. And as my senator over here has said, there are other options besides dissolve and reconstitute. S senator Roberts, then Senator Campbell. But let, me, let me back up just a little bit because uh, I'm afraid my Perhaps I wasn't clear on my comments, and they may be uh, not in the context in which I intend them. Um, legislatively, this, this is a legislatively created entity, which means that if you follow the proper process, and let, let, that is an insertion that I want to make, if you follow the proper process, it is an entity that could be dissolved. We cannot come back next month and you know, do that. That's not, there, there's a, a process that you would follow and we can defer to counsel if you want to hear the exact, we can make a recommendation, but we can't, you know, can't do it. My only point was that before we come back here next month, I just wanted all the members to understand that, you know, what the entity is. I'm not saying that that's what we should do next month. I'm not advocating for it. I'm just trying to explain. It's kind of like explaining a parliamentary procedure. Um, your motion, as I understood it, uh, for example, was different than what, a, what one of my colleagues understood it. But what, what I would ask you to do is just to restate your motion that you just want to call them back next month to answer more questions and then just and leave it at that. Um, that's what, what I would ask you to do because I think the point has been made that we've got some deeper, you know, deeper things that we want to contemplate. Um, but what I'm not doing, and I don't want my comments to be taken this way, uh, I'm not advocating that we do this just as chairman of the Senate Committee for Government Operations. I just want all the members to understand that this is a legislatively created entity that is subject to the, the entity review 
and so forth. And my, my previous chairman is shaking his head over here. So I just wanted to clarify that. And I want to point, look to my colleague real quick. Have I, have I clarified your concern? So I would appreciate it if you would be willing to restate your motion to just say you want to have him back next month. Before I recognize Senator Campbell as the maker of the motion, do you have a, a, a comment, sir? Yes, if it's okay with Senator Pody, and he's shaking his head, then I'd like to make the, amend the motion that the Department of Health comes back before this committee, make sure we have properly budgeted time to have the discussion uh, about uh, uh, moving forward as the Department of Health is in its current status, and uh, have continued discussion on the uh, uh, mature minor doctrine uh, the lack of errors and transparency to our citizens and continue the discussion forward on how we're going to move forward with the Department of Health. Senator Pote, do you wish to uh, maintain the second on that? Okay, Senator Campbell, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. On the, uh, on the motion, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, you know, I'm not under the impression from any of this conversation that there's any any kind of affront to the mature minor doc or the, the mature minor doctrine has posed a problem in this instance and moreover um, that youth are being targeted you know we're in the middle of a global pandemic uh, senator campbell please on the motion um so as far as the motion goes which i guess was predicated upon concerns about children being targeted um I, I just wanted to state that, that I, I haven't seen any evidence here that that's the case. Thank you. Senator Rose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we have uh, discussed this quite at length, and we've, the motion is for them to come back, so I'll call for the question on the motion. The question, the question has been called. Without objection, we're going to vote on in, formally inviting the department to return for our next meeting, which I believe is on 16 July. Is that correct, sir? July 21st, I'm sorry, 21 July. Uh, so the motion is before us, and uh, Mr. Clerk, please take the vote in the Senate. Senators Bell. Bell votes aye. Bowling. Aye. Bowling votes aye. Campbell. Aye. Campbell votes no. Crow. Aye. Crow votes aye. Jackson. Aye. Jackson votes aye. Kyle. No. Kyle votes no. Pody. Aye. Pody votes aye. Rose. Aye. Rose votes aye. Chairman Roberts. Aye. Roberts votes aye. Seven eyes, two noes. Motion passes in the Senate. We'll do a voice vote in the House. And before I call for the voice vote, if you wish to be recorded as a negative, please see the clerk after the, the vote, should it go positive. All those in favor of uh, the motion as presented, indicate by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Nay. If you wish to be recorded as a negative, see the clerk. Uh, you have a, I believe, uh, Representative Stewart, you had your hand up first. Oh, note. you want to be recorded as no? Okay. Gavel. The motion passes. The chair will take care of the appropriate documentation. Chairman Roberts, you're recognized. Um, I had asked if I could, if you'd come back to me for a question. Is that appropriate at this point for the commissioner? Yes, sir. You're recognized. Okay. Um, thank you, Commissioner, for being here. Uh, one of the things I want to clarify. The letter that was sent to the vaccination partners uh, and schools to kind of clarify that situation. What is the situation when a school this summer allows their facility to be used by the vaccination partners? Um, does that continue to operate under current TCA about what a school may or may not do with respect to parental consent, or is that a workaround where a vaccination partner can take advantage of the fact that kids are at a school, for example, football practice or band practice, and give the vaccination without parental consent? Because I see this as critically, critically important, because what I've, what I've heard you say is they can't do it during the school year without parental consent. But what I've not heard is that they can't do it when school is not in session and when the school itself is being used as a staging ground for one of the vaccination partners. So what about that scenario? Commissioner? Uh, thank you. I'll defer to council for a full um, explanation. Uh, it's my understanding that there is a difference between in school and school property. Uh, and as you mentioned, there are some events that happen on school property. Um, and so I'll defer to council to answer that. Councilor, you recognize, again, for the sake of those watching online, please give us your name and position. 
Uh, Grant Mullins, General Counsel for the Department of Health. So, uh, uh, Chairman Roberts, I, if there is a, if a, if a vaccination partner is just using the grounds, then it's treated just as it would be if it were a county health department or a church parking lot, et cetera. If they are, however, if, a, if the LEA or someone in the LEA has arranged for a vaccination partner to come to the school right at three o'clock so that kids are getting out of school and going there, that's not gonna work legally. That's, that's gonna implicate that title. So anything that involves the school coordinating something to allow for people to come for the purpose of vaccinating students, even if it's after hours, I think that's gonna be very legally suspect under current state law. Chairman Roberts. Thank you. Um, I wanna go back to what Representative Sapicki said earlier because I've already seen an email from one of the schools in my school district that's put, I'm just gonna call it the guilt trip on students if they don't get vaccinated and the vaccination partners are gonna be there on site to give vaccinations and they have very clearly implied that you don't have to have parental consent. And so I, what, what I wanna know in very clear language and from you, Commissioner, what I want to hear in very, very clear language is you have sat here and told us all day that you are that you're pro choice. And I know that this has become a political issue and we can look at the questions that have been asked from what party people are in as as to you know how these questions line up. But I don't think there's a lot of people on uh, you know, sitting around me that are convinced of that because it looks like that there is a mission here, an agenda here, to have children vaccinated with or without parental consent. So what I wanna hear in very clear, unequivocal language that, that during the summer, when school's not in session, that a football coach or a band director or a drama teacher or whoever it is it. ought not to be telling kids, hey, needs to be just come and get done so you don't have to sit out. So you don't have to miss practice. So you don't have to this, that, and the other. So. Thank you. So, uh, Chairman, I want to be exceedingly clear. Under no circumstance is the department encouraging children to seek out vaccination without parental consent. My point in, in describing the very rare circumstances in which this happens are to illustrate was to illustrate that this is an allowance for exceedingly unusual circumstances. For example, the ones that we have heard of, uh, children who have, I don't wanna be crass, but are not capable of taking care of their children because of their own issues. And you have a 16 or 17 year old who lives with uh, a substance abusing parent and is essentially responsible for their own health care. Another example is um, uh, an individual whose parents may not want to present to a government agency because of concerns of their own. Quite frankly, the vast majority of kids that come in alone, and like I said, it's in our experience has been eight statewide, the parents know, just like my kids, the parents know we consent, they're just unaccompanied because it was more convenient. I'm not suggesting that it doesn't happen otherwise, but I think, if you will allow me to be, speak somewhat frankly, I think there is a sense that we're hiding in dark alleys and whispering to kids, hey, come get vaccinated. We're not, we're not doing that. We're not encouraging that. It is an allowance, and we do believe that vaccination is the right thing to do for children, and so we don't want to prohibit that uh, if that's something that they want to do uh, in most circumstances. Ladies and gentlemen, we are running really oh. late on time. Therefore, I'm going to ask committee members, since we've invited these people back for the next uh, meeting, to hold your questions until the next meeting. Can, Mr. Chairman, could you let me just finish with one question? I just had one more question. You recognize one, one, one more question, comment. sir. Okay, actually, it's a comment. Here's what it looks like to me. It looks like the Department of Health is marketing to children, and it looks like you're advocating. That's what it looks like. Now, if it's not, then I'm, I'm gonna tell you, you've heard from all these other people in the committee that feel the same way. It looks like you're marketing to children. Market to parents. Don't market to 12 year olds, period. And I don't think you have a mandate to do that at all. 
And I think that, uh, that we're getting to the point that we're, we're being proactive with this, we're meddling, and I just, I don't think there's any sense that the majority of the people on this committee support that at all. So my very specific request to the Department of Health is to stop marketing to children and these messages that, that if you feel like you need to get them out, send them to the parents, but not to the children. But even then, ask the question, what is the role of the Department of Health in Tennessee? Is it to meddle in the lives of other people or is it to be a resource? Now, I know that we can talk about unusual circumstances, all these other things, but I think you know, we would all agree that the Tennessee Department of Health is to be a resource. Uh, we all agree with that, we're all on the same page. How proactive you go with that is where we get into decisions of opinion, we get into policy statements and things like that. And I think that the voice of this committee, the majority of the people that have spoken up today have basically made it perfectly clear that they think the Department of Health is marketing to children and that that needs to stop. So that is my very specific request that the message is loud and clear that the Tennessee Department of Health is respecting, for better or for worse, the role of the parent to the child and any messages that you give are focused to parents and not to children. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to recognize two more committee members, then we're going to have public comment, and the public comment will have to be very brief. I apologize to those of you that have traveled a long way to be here. Uh, you will have another opportunity if you want to come back. With that said, uh, Senator Bowling, you're recognized for a brief comment. Very briefly, sir, thank you. I did pass legislation this year, and I want people in the room to know, and, and also other members of this committee to know, if you didn't realize, no state entity can mandate the vaccine not a football coach, not a band leader, not anyone associated with the school system, uh, not any local governmental entity. That vaccines cannot be mandated by governmental entities in the state of Tennessee. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, uh, Rutter, you're recognized. Again, please be brief. Um, thank you for being here with us today. I know this is not easy uh, when you're under fire, but um, I'm going to add a little bit more fuel to that fire. Um, you say that you don't target children. I, of course, disagree with that um, because um, here's a tweet from the Tennessee Department of Health. If you're a, a Tennessee and age 12 plus, you're eligible to receive the COVID-19 vaccination. Visit your website and find out more about this vaccination. Now, this little boy that, and this is uh, something that I just pulled up before I walked into this committee, he looks 10, he doesn't look 12. He's not the young lady that uh, Chairman Sapicki has made a picture of. So there is another picture that has been tweeted out. So you are targeting to children. Let's just admit that's what we're doing. Um, it's not. It's not your business to target children. It's your business to inform the parent that their child is eligible for the vaccination. So I would encourage you before our next uh, meeting to get things like this off your website and put up information that actually gives out information to our parents, like Senator uh, uh, Chairman Roberts was talking about, that educates the parents they can educate their children, but when you tweet out something like this and you post pictures like this on your website, it does look like that you're targeting children. So I would suggest that you take that information down and change your direction. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And Commissioner, I understand that you have other appointments you need to get to. Uh, the, the chair is willing to excuse you if your staff will remain and field questions from the public. All right. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. I have a cabinet meeting. You're, you are excused. Thank you. We're going to go to uh, comments from the public next. And members of the public, I will apologize in advance for having to limit your time. I can only give you two minutes. And uh, I, I would suggest, again, if you have a spokesman that can represent two or three or more of you, it, it, it would be possible. First, uh, do we have a volunteer? Uh, I, I have on my list Kathy Arms or Harms. Okay. Who, who is this? Sandy Lavon, Lavorn, uh, Miss Lavorn, as you sit down for this, this is a uh, uh, streamed broadcast. So please give us your name and your address. Yeah, not your full address, just location. Yes, sir. My name is Sandy Lavorn. I'm a. 
check to make sure you've got a red light on your mic and pull it Hello. closer to you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, hi. My name's Sandy Lavorn. I'm a registered nurse from Gibson County. Please continue with your comments. And, yes, and you have two minutes. Okay. Yes, I'm here today to speak about the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. VAERS is one of the nation's early warning systems that monitors the safety of vaccines. The VAERS system is co-managed by the CDC and the FDA. According to Open VAERS, January through June the 4th of 2021, there have been 5,888 deaths. VAERS is what is called a passive surveillance system, meaning that instead of actively searching for potential side effects, it relies entirely on voluntary reporting. It has been proven by a Harvard study and reports submitted to the Department of Health and Human Services in 2010 that fewer than 1% of vaccine adverse events are reported by the VAERS system. The reason that there is less than 1% of adverse events reported is because doctors and clinicians aren't aware that the system even exists. And if they are, it's very challenging to enter the information. This entire system has been de designed to be dismissed. According to the Harvard study, we could deduce that the number of deaths and adverse events is closer to 500,000. The public is not being informed. Something very wrong is going on in our world. These are nefarious acts, and they must be investigated. I believe if the public knew the danger of the so-called vaccines, 30 seconds. then no one would take part in this human experiment. We are being lied to, and children are dying. In 1999, 15 children suffered from interception after receiving the rotavirus vaccine, and this vaccine was immediately taken off the market. We're aware that at least three children aged five to two months I'm sorry, to two years have died as a result of these experimental vaccines. The spike protein that's created in our bodies, it is a pathogenic toxin. It crosses the blood-brain barrier. It attaches itself to the spleen, the Ms. bone marrow, Laverne, the adrenal glands, the ovaries, and the testes, your time has and has been found circulating in the blood. Thank you. Uh, I have Dr. Phil Roberts who wanted to speak on the same comment. Again, please, sir. Uh, Brevity is the me? soul of wit, according to Shakespeare. So let's let's see if we can. Let's rock and roll. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I come to you as a doctor. I was taken out over vitamin D level. I practiced for 31 and a half years, both here and Kentucky. I'm board certified in emergency medicine, recertified. I have a master's in metabolic nutrition medicine, and blah blah blah. Anyway, I'm here as a grandfather and as a dad. It doesn't matter what party you're in. Let's talk about what's going on. Again, you heard about VAERS. Over 500 people in one week died. This is not about parties. The vaccination, is it a vaccine or is it gene modifying therapy? Who thinks it's a vaccine? Don't raise your hands so don't embarrass any of us. This has been very difficult for me to sort out. They say it's a vaccine, it's not. mRNA is a gene modifying therapy, which we don't know how long it's gonna last. So it makes these spike proteins, they you heard, anyway, we don't know. You can't go in and rearrange the human genome and think that you're gonna have a good result. That's ludicrous. That's what has happened, ladies and gentlemen. We do not know. The Nuremberg Trials, 1947, said you cannot experiment on kids or humans. We're doing that. They have not done this through animals. I know there are a few attorneys in the room. Could somebody help the boy here? I need some help. Go back and help me with this. You're not supposed to be able to do this. There are no animal trials. They've taken it straight to humans. And now we're coming to kids. There's a huge deal going on right now. The CDC is an emergency meeting two days from now, about this myocarditis with kids. Do me a favor, pump the brakes. Just pump it. Not in Tennessee. There are going to be plenty of other states that roll this out. Not only to 12-year-olds, they want to take it down to six-month-olds. Don't do it, y'all. Don't seconds. do it. Thank you so much. I am so honored to live in Tennessee. I am so thankful for each and every one of you. I don't care what party you're in. I've loved the discussion. You guys are awesome, and I feel so good about being here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Next on the list is Kathy Harms. No, she passes. Uh, Rebecca Nevis or Neves? Nevis. Nevis. Again, you have two minutes. Please give us your name and not a full address, just where you're from. Sure. Hi, I'm Rebecca Nevis, and I live in Shelby County, Tennessee. I'm here to discuss the lack of informed consent in the COVID-19 experimental vaccines. Our main concern is that 
the risks and benefits of everything from your hair dryer to your mattress are clearly displayed on a product, but there are no warnings or side effects listed on the advertisements that we're seeing come through on this vaccine, especially for our children. I have an 11-year-old daughter, and she recently had an article published in this magazine called Jabber Blabber in Shelby County, and it's free, it's colorful, it's very enticing and attractive to kids. They have been pushing a campaign called 901 Reasons to Wear a Mask. And in the last couple of months, their reasons have included so that we can see your face again soon, implying that the vaccines will be available for children soon, um, so that uh, they, because they are 100% effective and so that we can all get our vaccines and get back to our normal life. This is for children ages four through 12 that read this magazine. And they don't have the capabilities to do their research. They get excited about it. They want to fit in. They want the sticker that they would get at the vaccination site and go on with their life as normal children. One other example across the state in Chattanooga, the Macaulay School for Boys has offered exam exemptions for boys if they're able to get 500 students to receive the vaccination by the end of a particular week. This is, in our opinion, a, a type of coercion. Uh, it could be financial duress. Rhodes College is charging students $1,500 extra for tuition come fall if they are not vaccinated, as well as keeping them medically segregated from other students by mask wearing and social distancing. Our requests are to uh, ask you to please help us consider options to retract the minor, mature minor doctrine, um, assist in prohibiting coercion tactics by all advertising from COVID partners, specifically geared toward children, and help us protect our children of Tennessee. Thank you. Thank you. Your time has expired. Amy Miller is up next. Again, please give us your, your name, and, and uh, you have two minutes. Name and hometown, your two minutes. Uh, nope. So make sure you got a red light. And if need, pull oh, it closer. Pull there it closer. we go. Okay. I'm Amy Miller. I'm a mother. I'm also, I felt the need to say, I'm a former advertising agency owner. They are absolutely the Department of Health advertising to children, and it needs to stop. My child is sitting back here. I am the mother who will be there to fight for her if something were to go wrong should she be vaccinated without parental consent. I am the one, her father, my husband, is the other one that will also be there should something happen. Not the Department of Health, not the government, and matter of fact, they'll actually do more to push you aside if you are vaccine injured, and that's who I fight for. The vaccine injured and parental consent. A lot of times, less words is more. I'm shaking right now after hearing about this minor consent letter. It absolutely gave permission to vaccinate without parental consent. Every mother that I have spoken to who has come to me or I've shared the letter to has said the same exact thing. If that's what's being interpreted, you have what's called a brand gap Department of Health. That should never be the intent. And according to Patrick on the last committee meeting, he said that was not the intent of the Department of Health. I asked that the department retract that letter and send out something else. Something must be done. My child will never be vaccinated without my consent. Thank you. I'm Thanks. sorry that it's getting a little hefty, but I'm tired of the coercion. I'm absolutely tired of it. Stop. Thank you. Next on my list is Rolf Hazelhurst. I think I said that right. Again, give us your name and hometown. If you represent an organization, give us that as well. Uh, my name is Rolf Hazelhurst. I'm an attorney of uh, uh, Jackson, Tennessee. I do work for Children's Health Defense, but I'm here on behalf of my child who is vaccine injured. Uh, I will point out my son's uh, case, Hazelhurst versus HHS, was the second test case in the omnibus autism proceeding under the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. His case was at the center of the United States Supreme Court case of Bruzewitz versus Wyeth. The letter, by the, 
that we're referring to is a dangerous oversimplification of the mature minor doctrine in the Tennessee Supreme Court case. The letter portrays the age at which minors may consent to vaccinations in Tennessee without the parent's knowledge or consent as well established. It is not. However, the letter has tremendous legal consequences. I'll try to explain. Any legal action by a parent or a child challenging the administration of the vaccine without the parent's knowledge or consent must come under the Tennessee Health Care Liability Act. Under the Tennessee Health Care Liability Act, the locality rule is the primary legal hurdle that the plaintiff must overcome. The Tennessee Department of Health letter, and I point at him because there's no way, it was written by an attorney is it because of the effects it has. That letter has the effect of setting a statewide locality rule that children 14 and up may be vaccinated without the parent's consent. So if a parent brings a lawsuit on behalf of their child based upon lack of consent, I have no doubt whatsoever that that letter will be attached as an exhibit in the motion to dismiss and the motion for summary judgment. 20 I seconds. I can't stress it enough. That letter has tremendous legal effects. It is legal activism. It is not the job of the bureaucrats to write the law at which children can be vaccinated. It's your job. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I have on my list. Uh, Senator Pody, please brief. We uh, have 24 rules, you know. Chairman, and I, I do, it, and I apologize, because we do have 24 rules, but I don't know of anything that is more pressing than this right now. Uh, and, and I would love to address every single one of the people that testified, but I only have one to the doctor that, that did testify. Yes, uh, we, could, could I just- Doctor, could, could you come back up, please? Yes, sir. Uh, and, Again, please make the question brief and the answer brief. Yes, sir. Right. So the, the, you, you mentioned that you had data supporting your, your situation and, and the claims. Uh, if you would get that data to at least me or the chairman that we could distribute it to it's the- It's very easy. The state uh, of Tennessee, uh, uh, just, just, 99.994% of the kids in Tennessee did fine with no vaccine. You will never beat that with a vaccine. Don't waste hundreds of millions of dollars. Don't waste it. 99.94% of all kids did fine with this. You cannot justify a vaccine. Put it into the autism. If you, here's another hundreds of millions of dollar idea. Just go to the delayed vaccine. You get one out of 500 instead of one out of less uh, than doctor, 50. Doc, Thank you, I, sir. I, I'm, I'm done. Appreciate that, that's not the data I'm looking for. Just meet me afterwards. We'll, right. we'll talk. Thank you. Speaking of that, the chair is going to exercise privilege here. I'm going to request that those members who have testified from the public, uh, if you feel you didn't get your full time there to get all that you wanted to say said, please send me a letter and also copy uh, the Senate chair of this joint committee who will be chairing next month. I put a load on him. Uh, send us both those letters. We will ensure that they get distributed to the committee. With that said, uh, thank you to the Department of Health and we appreciate your presentation. Uh, I'm going to now declare this presentation closed and go into our regular agenda.